another fascinating conversation going on over there at IBMTV.TV. And I was checking out some of the conversation that was happening between Nick uh, Palveda as well as some of the other folks. I saw that Shaquille was having a great conversation as well. So we were definitely paying attention to that great conversation and checking out what that was all about um, over there on the other show that was taking place here on this great and powerful network. So definitely was glad to hear that they were engaged in a wonderful conversation and glad to uh, be uh, checking them out. Actually left uh, over there from measurement and uh, was doing my work from over there. But then I came over here to get ready for three shows of uh, podcasting on this particular Monday uh, afternoon. Y'all know on Monday afternoons, I wind up doing uh, three shows. I do this show. And then, of course, I also do the show that features uh, Mullins Music and Memories. And I've got some guests lined up for that. And I think we might have some folks popping in here as well during the course of this particular day also. But definitely, you know, I close it all out with the audio podcast and that will take place from seven to nine. So it's like two to nine, seven hours straight of great podcasting coming your way on Monday afternoons. Glad to be able to provide you with all kinds of interesting thoughts, interesting things going on in the world. Like I said, Shaquille and uh, Nick and the crew were talking about taxes, the tax plans of uh, Biden and a number of other things that they were interested in and were concerned about. So it was great checking out what they had to say about a number of issues and just following their conversation. So I had the pleasure of checking that out. And of course, like I said, we're going to see some other things going on in the world as well. Of course, I've been trying to pay attention to a number of things happening here in our local news, as well as, of course, on the national front as well. By the way, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has issued a sweeping mask mandate on planes and public transportation that went into effect or goes into effect at 11.59 p.m. ET on Monday. The mandate applies to all travelers, including those on airplanes, trains, buses, ride shares, and all transportation hubs like airports and subway stations. The move is happening days after President Biden ordered government agencies to immediately take action in order to control the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. A CDC official says the mandate will protect Americans and provide confidence that we can once again travel safely even during this pandemic. And definitely, um, I saw that here in the Durham area, our buses are already having that mask mandate and had it for a number of months. And I know that I'm always wearing my mask when I go out and whether it's on the, the uh, mass transit or whether it's just going out and about in general. So definitely I'm glad to see that they were following those rules and definitely having that, that mass mandate on their side. So definitely I saw that that was one of the news items that appeared. And I'm sure there'll be some other things that are going on as well. But definitely that was one of the things that was going on. And by the way, I saw that uh, Nick was talking about Facebook and he was saying that he had actually somehow managed to get himself in trouble with Facebook and all of that. But it seems that Apple and Facebook are having some tensions. As a matter of fact, it says that tensions are said to be rising between two tech world giants as Facebook contemplates an antitrust lawsuit against Apple, according to the, uh, the company of Apple anti-competitive app store practices uh two anonymous sources were telling the uh new york times so yeah they were accusing the company of anti-competitive app store practices and that's what some anonymous sources were saying and all of that friction has been building ahead of apple's upcoming release of its app tracking transparency feature which will impact user data that fuels facebook's digital advertising business but he didn't mention facebook by name Apple CEO Tim Cook linked the company to rising polarization, balance, and recent erosion of trust. So that's definitely something that I know a lot of folks have been following on a number of fronts, the erosion of trust and all of that. And then uh, another story that I saw that folks might be interested in was the concept of whether 2021 could be seeing a new oil giant, one of the largest corporate mergers could be formed after the CEOs of ExxonMobil and Chevron spoke last year about combining into one oil giant, and that's what's been reported by the Wall Street Joiner, citing anonymous sources who said talks were preliminary and aren't 
ongoing, but could come back in the future. With oil and gas demand plunging as people stayed home, the pandemic has hit the oil industry especially hard. The market value of a combined Exxon Chevron could surpass $350 billion, thus becoming the world's second largest oil company after Saudi Arabia's Aramco. So definitely that would be a major player in the, uh, the oil industry. There is no doubt about that. So we're going to see if that actually comes to fruition or does not come to fruition and all of that. For those of you that are worried about certain stores going out of business, it looks like Toys R Us has closed two of its stores. Toys R Us says the pandemic is to blame for the closure of its two remaining U.S. stores. A little over a year after the smaller format shops opened, although a spokesperson told CNBC it may seek out new locations. Based on market research, toy sales actually jumped 16% in 2020 to more than $25 billion as parents tried to keep their children occupied during the crisis. Many of these purchases were made online with e-commerce toy sales seeing a 75% year-over-year increase overall. Toys R Us says it will continue to invest in the channels with uh, strong shopper traffic. And I'm sure that Veronica Jean, my good friend, is into e-commerce and all of that. And she would be quite pleased learning that, that information and all of that. Well, I've got a good friend that's popped in and I've become friends with him. So I'm going to learn a little bit about Reverend Carl. He called me the voice. I call him the man with the plan and all of that. So definitely looking forward to having a conversation with Reverend Carl Watkins. I had the pleasure of meeting him through Brian Shulman. So definitely Brian has popped in on this show in the past. Tim has popped in as well. And I was telling my uh, good friend, Zach Roberson, who was doing his funk music with Zach and brought in some relatives of his who were affiliated with a church in Virginia, that we would be having two days of church because Reverend Watkins was going to come in the house as well. So that being said, we're going to bring Reverend Watkins into the house and see what he's got going on in his book of the woods and all of that. So Reverend Watkins, for those that, those that don't know you, like I said, this is the international broadcast media and we do a lot of great programming here. And definitely uh, I've had the pleasure of having Tim on, had Brian on and had uh, some of the other folks that go into Brian's Saturday show, as well as even the Wednesday shows like Veronica Jean on this platform, even Raquel Boris has been on here as well. So you're a newcomer, so definitely tell the folks around the world, because we've got some shows that are even done out of South Africa and a number of other places. So tell folks a little bit about who Reverend Carl Watkins is and what he's all about. Hey, hey, it is great, Mark, to uh, be on your show, man. Uh, Brian Shulman pushed me out, uh, pushed me out on this platform uh, not too long ago. We got to talking in, uh, with him and sharing some great things and to your audience is just uh first of all just want to give thanks and honor to god always him first is the head of my life but i just want to also thank that it is um black history month and i just yes. posted a post on uh, linkedin uh not too long ago maybe a couple hours ago uh about black history and i said this is our history because right. none of this history could not be <laughs> without black history so I say we got to celebrate it all at this time. But, uh, yeah, my name is Carl Sean Watkins. I am a minister, even though uh, Brad gave me the name Rev. I, I just thought that would be a catchy name for a show, The Reverend and the Voice. Yes. You know <laughs> I thought it would be a catchy name for a show. But um, by uh, by trade, I'm a uh, paralegal uh, studying to be an attorney, um, delving into uh, civil rights and family law. Those are the two concentrations of which uh, I'm very interested. But as far as being on this LinkedIn platform, it has just been a great thing for me to kind of like get out a lot of things that I've written and and, and just kept to myself as a, uh, even starting from a child on up until this present point. But it has been, um, I was on on LinkedIn, I guess I first came on about 2008. And it was just a platform for uh, employment and putting your resume out there. That is truly what it was. And I did not think of it in any other kind of way. And I liked it actually because of the adult process in which it took. Nobody was on there bashing nobody. Nobody was on there trying to follow nobody. Nobody was taking pictures of a dinner from the night before, you know. So I, <laughs> I kind of felt fine with that. I said, it's, I'm an old soul. So this was kind of like what I needed. But uh, as time grew on and I just would pop in and out of it, I never knew uh, until maybe about a year ago how dynamic this platform really was. And right. it started to pivot. And, and, I, and I, 
I can say that that probably uh, happened for the most part because of the pandemic. But yeah. I started to see a pivot a little bit before that when people were starting to kind of like put their antlers out and put out some personal things concerning themselves and, and see what feedback we got. And uh, in the midst of looking at that, I, I saw that in my own self. And, and uh, I saw the feedback and I was like, hey, this community is pretty supportive. Like, uh, you know, you put out a one or two things, you don't go explicit in your uh, details. But I put out a couple of things and I was like, hey, and then I got a lot of people didn't respond so much on posts, okay. but my inbox was flooded and I was getting people, oh man, I, I just congratulate you for sharing that, man. I've been feeling that same way, but I didn't have the guts to kind of like put it on and I didn't want people to look at me. And that got my wheels to turn. I say, how much helpful can one person be? Because we're always talking about trying to make a difference. But yeah. how, how much helpful can one person be if you initiate those things for other people to join? If you initiate those kind of perspectives where other people feel a comfort zone of actually just sharing some of the things that's going on with them. And uh, that's what I've been doing. I didn't do the shout out part like <laughs> Brian does. Nobody can do it like him, man. I, I, Nobody I, can he, shout out like Brian does. Brian's a master of the shout out. He just does oh, a great man. job with that shout out. I don't he even does. know how he does it the way that he does it. Either. He does it yeah. so effectively and so um, effortlessly. I mean, he just effortlessly the way he does it and everything. One of the things you said that I really found interesting was you were talking about, of course, it is Black History Month and everything along those lines. I even saw that on YouTube, that if you go to the YouTube channel, they've got BHM right next to it in colored letters and everything, just to let you know that they are also aware that it is Black History Month as well. And I was just wondering, uh, Carl, uh, Reverend Watkins, if there's anything that you, uh, if there are any certain Black history figures that are your favorites. I know that I was a big fan of both of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, but also of Frederick Douglass and a number of others. But I was just wondering who were some of your favorite Black history uh, fans or people that really resonate with you? I also resonate with, of course, Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. But I was just wondering yeah. who were some of the folks that really resonated in your life as far as Black history goes? You go, uh, you, you kind of like taking a path, and I guess that we pretty much on that same journey because of uh, uh, how we think and how we reverence those that come before us. I got, I went to uh, Martin Luther King High School in Chicago, so he was first and foremost uh, the one that we were always made to be educated about. I mean, if one of the counselors or the teachers stopped you in the hall, you better have a fact about Martin Luther King. That's just how that was embedded in me. But when I look upon history on the Freedom Ride, I really think I really think a lot about Harriet Truman and um, her her dedication to empowering others. And people look at that and they have their own interpretation of she freed the slaves. Oh man, the, the, that's 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 minute compared to what she put in process and the uh, the things that she done. In essence, yes, yeah, she was freeing, but she also was enabling. She was also empowering. She was giving these people opportunities to be something that they could not have been in the places that they were. And her movement was just totally great. I think about her. Of course, I think about King. I even think about uh, another young young black man that was in Chicago, Barack. I think about some of the uh, fabulous things uh, and the trailblazing things that he could not have done without King or Malcolm X because he's, he's another great one. Uh, just two people doing the same thing, just different paths. Same, oh, yeah. same, same mindset, same regulations, same same thing that they wanted for their people. They just took different uh, avenues in which to get there. So they're both great men of renown. I know a lot of people try to pit them against each other. You know, those who don't know, oh, man, uh, you want to be like Malcolm? You, hey, hey, it's the same thing. They were on the same goal, and they were trying to do the same thing for their people. So I definitely uh, think about them on the entrepreneurship, man. I think about Madam C.J. Walker. How, you know, she put it out there. You know, these are ones that aren't always on the tip of our tongue that's so fabulously talked about. But these are ones when we look upon our history that has really set a precedent for us to be, you know, who we are and achieve the things we've done. Yeah, they've definitely done some great things. I know that we lost, and I know that I mentioned it on oh, Brian's man. show. You said that you were definitely impacted by them as well, but we definitely lost yeah. some legends out of our community. Of course, we lost some legends out of other communities like Larry King, but out of our community, yeah. we lost John Cheney, Cicely Tyson, and Hank Aaron. So I was just wondering your thoughts on those individuals and what their legacy will be as we move forward. Uh, when I think of Cicely, I think, uh, I think of royalty. It, it's no way to put it. When uh, we talk about the, the uh, 
Prince Charles and 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 Diana and those things that and they have their place and it, it's not nothing uh nothing to do against them. But I say when I think about history and I think about Cicely Tyson, I think about royalty. I think it's about the roles and even the uh, stand that she take and uh, taking opportunities and not taking roles that would demean us. A lot of people and I say this, I might get backlash from it, but you know I, I stand on my own two feet. When Tyler Perry first came out. I really had a problem with the depictions of how he had blacks to be. And even though he had a feel good story and a little Christian singing and so at the end of his plays, a lot of those stereotypes, I really, they really, they really was a thing that, uh, that didn't sit well with me. And there was no condemnation on him. That's how he, you know, he chose to do his craft. But I think that we, as uh, African-Americans, we had to find ways that we can show the world we are more and just a song and a dance, that we are more than the athlete catching a ball. We're more than, like the Bronx say, just shut up and play. And uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't care about America. It doesn't mean that we stand to stay on some high platform, is that we come from kings and queens. I mean, right. when we look back on our African heritage, yo, they was building things back then that you guys had no idea about building in the U.S. or would not have got done. So, you know, on that, on that stake, and John Cheney, I don't know how I left him out, man. I'm in New Jersey. Across the bridge from Philly, man, uh, my baby brother went to Temple. Uh, you know, we didn't play it in that hall. We didn't play pickup basketball. And there's John Cheney. I think they're about to rename it now if they haven't done so. And uh, the mark that he's left in, in sports and for the little man, some of the stories out on him that he uh, was teaching at a high school up here. And uh, he taught the home ec class. And what he would do is go grocery shopping and cook the food in the home ec and just invite kids that he knew wasn't getting meals to come in his class and get plates to take home. I mean, stuff like that people don't know about, you know what I'm saying? But those are the kind of people, Larry King, you couldn't, I mean, I've always been a fan of his, cannot denounce uh, what he's done, his, his uh, interviewing style. It's kind of been something that I picked up, you know, in, in the midst of doing my interviews. So these people are legends, man. They leave in here, but you know, it's everybody time, everybody got to go and it's your time. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's got their time and their time and their place and everything. And everybody's got their journey here on Earth. And hopefully everybody is accomplishing those journeys. Because I think that we're all brought down here to accomplish a mission of some sort or another. That we're all here put yeah, for yeah. some sort of destiny that is part of the reason that we are put here on this Earth. And that's just the way that things are gone and everything. You were talking about sports. And we had the pleasure yesterday of talking to Stephanie Anderson. And she is a woman with the NFL uh, sisters in service and they're doing some stuff around the Super Bowl and everything but she was talking about the impact of concussions and how a lot of times we don't think about that with professional football because she's actually was married to a gentleman that played in the league and was suffering and still suffers from some of those impacts that he had to go through so definitely you know we can't all um, be thinking that we're going to make it as athletes or as entertainers so you're so right about that and we also have to think about sometimes even the consequences of those things when we do go into them because as she was saying a lot of times we don't think about the impact that you might have as a professional athlete professionally if you're in one of those high impact uh, fields like um, hockey or like uh, football or even some of the other ones that are really high impact so a lot of times we don't think about that unfortunate everything I was going to just make a comment to something else that I noticed yesterday and everything I still see you got it as your backdrop but I saw that you've got that picture of the um, last supper behind you and everything Absolutely. and I remember that that definitely impacted me because definitely my uh, grandparents were very much into uh, the uh, church. They were very much involved in Pine Chapel up in the area of Hollister, North Carolina, when they were living and all of that. I want to say my granddad was a deacon and grandma was definitely involved in the church and would be considered like a church mother and all of that. But definitely I remember that uh, kind of picture being around the house and of course that uh, famous picture of uh, Jesus that many people remember and everything that was also hanging on the wall and all of that. So I was just wondering if you talk about the impact of faith just in your life in general and particularly that picture because I, like I said I noticed that you use that kind of your as your backdrop so what that picture of the Last Supper means to you and everything. I'm sure that folks around the world would love to hear that because even though we have folks of different uh, denominations and also different religions a lot of times I find, and this is just my thought, that a lot of times the uh, religions all have the basic same goal, which is that they would like to, uh, 
a greater humanity in terms of peace and love. They definitely want us to respect our parents. They want us to respect our neighbors and a lot of those things. And sometimes the extremists, they get in the way and that's when we get yeah. into trouble with religion. But I was just wondering your thoughts about the meaning of the Last Supper to you as well as just faith in general. Faith is faith is me. Faith is what I am. Faith is inspiration. Faith is uh, what I what I deem to be. When I uh, I know the old people used to say, when you see when you see me, I want you to see Christ, and and that's how I was brought up. That's how I live my life. And yes, I did detour. Don't let me get it twisted for any of you guys out there. I had my problems. I had my struggles. I had my issues, and things still aren't the greatest. But one thing I know that if you uh, the grandparents used to say go to the rock, which is higher than I. So when I got a problem or I got an issue, I I, I do the prayer and I, and I got to talk to God about it. You know, I don't have no whole sequelae or I have a long conversation, but I talk to him as in, Lord, you know, I need you. So I keep that and that keeps me grounded. And this picture behind me, I had, um, when I went to get it and uh, I thought, well, I'm sitting in my, uh, my son room and we sometimes eat out here. And I said, I had to find a place because I'm getting my office done to actually start doing this kind of thing. And um, I said, I had to find a place that, that cements me that says who I am behind me. Because I know we get behind some people that have beautiful pictures and they have the backdrops or even they may have those, you know, phony made up backgrounds. I said, I wanted something that when they look and uh, come on my show and talk to me or if I'm on someone else's show and, and I'm doing a Zoom or whatever I'm doing, I want that to know that that that's behind me and that's how I live my life. And, and to that, as far as the uh, faith, everybody has a different faith and you, and you put it right on the head, but you have those that come in and try to make the monikers of, you know, you do this or you do that. And they nitpick about, you know, different ones. And a lot of people, if you would research uh, Christianity and said, that's pri primarily how you got all of these because everybody had a different opinion about what should be done in the church. So that's how you got the Catholics, the Protestants, the, you know, the, the Methodists and those things. But uh, faith is, is, is what drives me. It what gives me inspiration. I tell people that when I started my Daily Word series, and I don't know if you, um, you have seen it or you followed it, uh, I tell the, tell the story uh, about how uh, Christmas time, and, and I was thinking about five or six, and I was a child that wrote a lot, that scribbled, and, and I read, I started reading early. And uh, there was three of us, as I have another brother and a sister. And uh, they got what they wanted for Christmas. My brother wanted a fire truck. He was into fire trucks and that kind of thing. And my sister, of course, was into Barbies. And uh, I was a kid that was into books, but I tell you, this Christmas, I did not want a book for Christmas. I had the Dr. Seuss, you know, the old, uh, right. get what it was, eight pennies, uh, eight books for a penny. And I looked for it in the mail when they sent the new one. I was that kind of kid. And uh, this Christmas, um, I opened my gift and I got a dictionary, <laughs> a brand new dictionary, Webster dictionary, unused, bought, still wrapped in the plastic. And uh, I was kind of saddened at that. And my dad saw my face and uh, he asked me to come out and sit up on the couch because they had the couch there in the tree. And him and my mom was sitting watching us tear up in the presents. And uh, he knew that I just something wasn't right with that. And uh, he said, well, what's wrong? And I said, I'm happy. I said, oh, I'm happy. He's like, well, your face will turn you happy. He said, but I'm going to explain this gift to you because I want you to know something. And I was like six, I think I was six years old. And he said, uh, I gave you this because you're special. Mm -hmm. And I say, I'm special. He said, yeah. He said, it's not that I don't love you or your brother or your sister the same. I do. He said, I gave them the things that they wanted because that's what they wanted. But he said, what I gave to you, we're going to share for many more Christmases than just today. So I was like, oh, okay. So I'm thinking as a kid, you know, I was buying for time with dad. I'm like, oh, this is good. He said, this is the game we're going to play. He said, uh, every day, he said, we're going to start from the beginning. At a, he said, I'm going to have you uh, get a word, be able to spell the word, uh, define the word, and be able to use it in the dictionary. And he said, every day, we're going to do that, and, and that's going to be our game. So, man, you telling me about a, a kid love his dad. I just thought that was just the greatest thing. We just going to have us time. You know, this is something that nobody else could do. But uh, we went through it. And some days I had, because, you know, the dictionary has short words. Some days I had a couple of short. I think about seven, eight months time, I finished the dictionary. And my dad died at 15. And it did not come to me what he had gave me until he was gone. And when he did, I talked to an English teacher. 
uh, and when I was like 16, and uh, she is, saw some of the things I wrote and some of the some of the poetry I wrote and some of the letters I wrote, and she had saved them over the course of me being her class. And she's like, "You're a special kid." And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, your vocabulary. She's like, it's unlike any child I've ever had in my English class. She was like, you're going to be something one day. And I, and, I, and I never really thought of it, but I went back over my life now and I look at it. He was just building something in me. He saw something that, and he wasn't no great man. My, my, my dad was a painter, car, but that's what he did. He, he redid houses and he wasn't no, you know, he was very smart up here, but he wasn't no school smart. He was just like, I know what's going on smart. And he told me, man, and he gave me that. So now this is what I give to the world. I started a daily word series and I'd get a word, I'd define it. And I write what that word means to me in essence of how you should feel about that word. And that's where it comes from, man. And what are some of the most important words that you found that you really have enjoyed in your daily word series, whether that was words of uh, passages, maybe it was something from Proverbs or Psalms, or maybe it was just a general word. But what are some of the things that you've actually found that you have really resonated with you in your daily word series so far? Because I'm sure there's some that have resonated more with you and with your audience than others. And I was actually just reading a book and I'm still reading it. It was called The Know-It-All. And it's a generally a gentleman that decided he wanted to go about and read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. And it was just it, the way that it impacted on him as well mm -hmm. as on his family and all of that. And he actually wrote it as if it was done in a dictionary form. So it's literally like A to Z. I think I'm on either L or M right now okay. and everything because I pick it up and read a little bit of it, put it down, set it aside, and then come back yeah. and read more of it. But definitely in your own series, what are some of the things that really have impacted you in the words that you have picked, whether, like I said, those were biblical words or whether those were just general words? The biblical words always give me that, but the word the word of God is just so much and so. Each time you go in there and open it up, something new becomes, even if you read the same verse, uh, I can remember reading uh, Psalms 23 as a kid and hearing that. And I've read Psalms 23 as an adult. And it has a whole new different meaning to me as it did as a kid. And that that's kind of like, uh, I praise that guy for writing it up. Like, I don't know what I would have looked at my dad if he had gave me encyclopedias and tried to pull that, <laughs> tried to pull that same thing. I, I don't know how that would have went. But I do say that uh, my word resilience. That's a word that it really is. It's really hum. It's really harmless to me, as the things that I've been in my life: abuse survivor, survivor of addiction, overcome depression. And I'm on a platform where I can pull somebody else. And see, this is what everything I think that has been given to me as a purpose. Uh, those things that were given to me, because you can't tell me. My dad used to tell me, and my dad drank, and he used to say, "You can't tell me how it feels uh, to be hungover." And you have a drink. He said, now you can tell me what the book tells you about it. He said, you can tell me what you know to understand it on paper. But he said, you can't tell me that uh, what hungover is unless you've experienced hungover. And that resonated with me. And I said, you can't, with everything I've been through, resiliency is always there because nothing has been able to keep me down. I mean, I've been in places and lows and valleys. But I've always fought my way back to the peak. And in the peak, I don't want people to misunderstand. Peak is not material. Peak is not substance. Peak is the thing that's in you that's elevated at a point in time in your life. And that way, I know what my foundation is, what it is. And I get that. And I know that that's the case because I wrote a piece, I did resilience. So I try to do that, actually, because I love that word. I try to do that word once a month. And I come off on it whole differently every time. And a lady wrote to me, a uh, lady, I think she lived in uh, Nigeria. Yeah, Nigeria. Of course, I've never been. And she wrote, she read that. And I did video series on that when I first started. And uh, she said that she played my video. I was in, she was in my network and she had been reading some of my posts. And she said she had never responded. She said, said she would read it and enjoyed it and went about. But she said that day that she read that post about resilience. She said her son was in a whole lot of mess. She said her husband was doing a whole lot. And she said she was reading that from her phone on the cliff. And I had no idea. Really, I was saying on the cliff, I'm thinking like, you know, I'm thinking like picturize that not a cliff that you're sitting on, but a cliff like you're at the end of your wit. And right. uh, she sent me a picture of her in that, in that message. 
and she was actually sitting on the cliff of a hill and she was about to jump off for it and she read my post now you look at that and you say i mean for one thing i got a tear i'm just going to be honest with you i got a tear because that so emotionally moved me that something i wrote can have that much effect on someone else and it was not written for i didn't write i don't write things to like get a paycheck i don't write stuff i don't share what i share you know to be looking for someone to say ah that a boy pat on the back kind of thing i write it to be a transformation and that right there uh, let me know that my word series were doing was doing things for people and it was being what god wanted it to be he wanted it to be a purpose when that little boy that was five years old that sat on the couch with his dad got that dictionary that was in the plan so what i'm doing now is the plan i'm just walking through the door well so that was it. almost like the scene from it's a wonderful life because i know that that's uh, what yeah. it resonated with it almost sounded like it's a wonderful life which is actually one of my favorite christmas movies and all of that so it almost seems like just that kind of scene that they were right there on the edge and were ready to go mm -hmm. over the edge but what you wrote actually influenced them to actually come back into the uh light and everything to use that kind of analogy and everything so mm -hmm. definitely a lot of times folks don't think about the fact and if you don't mind talking about it i'm sure that our sure. Uh, listener audience would love to hear more about it but we don't talk about and hear enough about the fact that we in our community do go through abuse whether that's abuse in relationships and i've known some folks including myself that have gone through relationships that were forms of emotional abuse and all of that mm -hmm. so definitely if you could just share a little bit about that journey and where you are in that journey and how you are actually going through that journey because i know a lot of times we don't think about um people in our community particularly african-american males going through the abuse thing. A lot of times we think more about the women that go through it and don't necessarily think about the man or the young boys that go through it as much. So if you could share a little bit about that, if that's okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's absolute. It's 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 who I am. My, my vulnerability has become my power. So therefore, in essence, that I've empowered myself to, to talk about and go over it. And being abused as a child and a family member, this is what we always encounter uh 95 out of 100 within the black community it, it's a family member someone that's entrusted to watch uh, entrusted to be over your child entrusted to be over and in my case it was my uncle and one i love and when he came back from um when he came back from vietnam he was not he was not right and and and, and i and i know that now but i i, I just i just loved him that much as as a child and not so much as what he done to me but i just loved him that much because of the respect that i had for him and not only that how the family i came from uh my family intermediate family is not that big but my mom is 13 of them and my daddy was 12 of them so we have a huge background and family and they both was from mississippi they both was like tula jackson and tupelo so they were close in proximity even growing up as kids so we had a lot of the closeness of that, and we had a lot of the stigma of which I refused to raise my children in, don't tell. Mm -hmm. And that's really what fostered a lot of the abuse and the things that took place, because here I am as a child. There's no way in the world that I can share the things that my uncle did to me with my father, his brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not only would it not be taken seriously or not even given any credence to, uh, I would get in trouble for yeah. saying that you know and this is what we dealt with so i carried that on and you know what that led to with me living the kind of life that wasn't like that not that i became the abuser but i became the introvert i became of writing everything i became of you know just secluded uh, not really having a lot of friends growing up i was a social butterfly on the outside and just the dull light on the inside those kind of things that i use uh, i always wanted to be funny so that way it could take away the pain those things that you never talk about and you never relate to people because we're just tough. Like my dad, don't cry, boy. Wipe your face. I don't care if a truck just hit you. You ain't supposed to cry about it. You know, so, and this is the kind of things that as the African American male has grown up with. And it's it's time now to release that. It's uh, I told my son he's twenty one. Taught my son it's okay to cry. It, it, it's fine. It's okay to let go. It's okay to let loose. It's okay to be in touch. With uh, I don't even use the term sensitive side because we have a uh, we have a disclaimer about that that you're this way or that way. But there is a sensitive side to the man that that God gave us. 
so that we can be empathetic and sympathetic to other people. We tend to turn it off and we tend to not deal with it. But no, I've never had a shame about it uh, now in my adult life because it's a it's a tool that I utilize and that abuse that I covered, I went into the military and then that turned into an addiction, which was drinking. I drank to numb the pain because I definitely couldn't tell anybody at adult, but it's took in place my whole childhood life, you know? So I went to the alcohol and, and the alcohol was all that. Yes, I was functioning. And to this day, I have a problem with functioning because I really wasn't. It was, I call it muscle memory because I remember, and my, my body remembered what it was supposed to be doing at work times, but I wasn't there. Alcohol had me and I, I fought that for the longest and it, it creeped in into my lifestyle and it creeped into me taking me down to the bottom and then with the bottom, then here comes another tag along, the depression. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to the point of where, you know, uh, do I want to be like, you know, do I want to be like uh, Bailey? <laughs> you know, do I want to jump off the bridge? Do I want to? Yeah. But I always had this connection with God to know that if you don't give me a chance, you know what I mean? And that's really what you're doing when you're taking your own life. You're not giving God a chance to show you who he is. Right. And I just came to that realization when it came to that. I said, oh, man, I got a lot to offer. Why would I jump off the bridge? You know what I mean? Oh, I'm not this PhD. I'm not this MDD. I don't have a lot of alphabet behind my name. But my experience speaks wonders. If you listen, you know what I mean? A lot of times you don't give credence to what people say because they're not this or they're not that. Or you can't tell me anything. I, I can learn from babes. The Bible say out of the mouth of babes. So what yeah. does that tell you? <laughs> babes can teach you something. So you just have to be the one to listen, man. And your audience is wide. If there's someone struggling, if you find someone that you feel that is a landing zone, that's what I call myself. I want you to take out of a conversation with me that you feel safe to be here. It's like an airplane sitting at the, at the airport. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't land anywhere else. It right. lands at the airport because it feels safe there. And it can accommodate the weight there. That's how I've always been. I've been able to accommodate the weight. I've always been you know, had close uh, relationships with people. Some people, man, I've never let, I've never met before in their life. I felt the, the need to share something with me that was transforming to them. And they just felt that they could tell me. And, you know, and I just say that that's God. And, I, and he knows that, you know, he knows that. But that is just some of the things that I've been through, man. I, we don't even have time. And I know your guests don't want to hear my sad stories, but man, I'm like over I said, we love hearing we love hearing about different people's stories and all of that. So definitely, and I wanted to explore a little bit of things with you, but we definitely got time to explore some of those things. But definitely, yeah. I was just amazed at some of the things you said because a lot of times we do get caught up in wanting people just to uh, have those PhDs, those fancy houses, and things along those lines. But a lot of times, folks can actually teach us that may not have those things and everything. I even see that sometimes in relationships. I'm in my late 50s and still single, but I do know that sometimes folks will write you off in relationships because you don't have the car that they want or the house that they want or the job that they want or things of that nature. So we do find folks that will sometimes get caught up in the superficial. And one of the other things you said is about uh, some of the folks in your family might not have had book sense, but it sounds like they had a lot of common sense. And common sense yeah. can sometimes trump book sense in a lot Absolutely. of other ways, because a lot of times we get caught up with folks that got plenty of book sense, but they might not know that much common sense, and they might run into all kinds of trouble when they have to go into places that require common sense and all of that. So like I said, that book sense, I'm not knocking it because I definitely have my uh, BA from Marquette University, but I know my brother is in the process of getting his PhD and uh, definitely have family members with PhDs and masters mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Some that are their own degrees and some that were honorary. So I'm not knocking the education system, but mm -hmm. I know one of the things that our uh, founders here talk about on this uh, platform is they talk about how they feel that our entire education system is kind of rooted in a misnomer because they one of the things that Kim Calhoun and Nick Palvedo talk about who are two of the primary founders of the international broadcast media is that they feel that we're using 18th century models in the 21st century. And they definitely talk about that even in the way that our education system is set up. They feel that we should actually be in bringing some more 21st century kind of models, even teaching things like financial literacy and teaching things that a lot of folks don't know, like entrepreneurship and all of that. And I know that Nick would very much be glad to know more about you and your going to law school because he's actually a lawyer and has several law shows. As a matter of fact, the show on that before me was Tax Time, and they were talking about 
the tax codes and things that Biden is putting into to affect he was doing something work fans and then they have the lawyers then and like i said he is definitely a lawyer himself and definitely a fan of the legal profession but he definitely feels that there are a lot of things that just our regular school systems should be teaching whether that's financial freedom whether that's um how to balance books and how to balance your own personal budgets or even how to deal with um legal things like taxes and things along that line. So they oftentimes talk about that. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. Is that something that you feel, even as one that went to school in New Jersey, that you wish you had learned more about some of the basic day-to-day life kind of things that you've had to deal with as a parent, as a uh, husband, as one that's involved in a number of family things, even involved with your church? There would be some of the skill sets that you wish that you had learned even earlier in life. There are some, and I, I can't say, Mark, that I, I've been blessed because I was so, I had a dad who was a handyman who can fix and, and do anything. And, and I always was, I always was a little angry with him because he, he wasn't one that his father pulled him along and made him do chores or made him do those things. We had chores and we had responsibilities, of course, but he would not let me go with him to do those jobs. His thing was, I want you to be the one that is able to pay someone like me to do these jobs. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, I want you to be an educated one where you don't have to revert to doing these jobs. I just thought of it all the time. It was just a great thing. It, it would marvel my eyes to see him just take some wood and go build a chair. I mean, these are kind of things that were like really marvelous to me. And I really wanted a part of, but he would not have any part of that. And uh, to these day now, I've been taking some DIY classes, DIY them yourself and I didn't learn how to nail a few things and do a few things but I just think about uh just his thought process in that and him not having uh nothing but a uh, 12th grade education and graduating from high school and my mom on the other hand she was a scholar you know she's a CPA now she's been doing that forever so we got our math sense from her and our ability to learn so I was kind of like fortunate that I was in a two-parent household with two parents of two dynamics I had a father who was street smart, very brilliant in the streets. And not only that, he was church smart because my mom, my grandma was a preacher. So my dad, he could say your Bible verse, quote, for quote, you go pull the Bible open. He ain't missed the word, but that wasn't his thing. That wasn't his call. And so my grandmother said, well, maybe you'll be the preacher because your dad sure ain't doing nothing with it. That used to be, that used to be what she used to tell me all the time. But uh, those kind of things was phenomenal to me in the essence of how it prepared me for life and how we prepared uh, things. So I had, uh, I was blessed to have an up, uh, upmanship on that because when I had my two children, I have a daughter, uh, 25, she's working on her uh, master's in nursing. And and my son is, he's going to be a CPA. He wants to be like his grandmother. Uh, he's a junior now in uh, college. So they're, they, they had a foundation of me going through them with a checkbook when I didn't have anybody, you know, you know, have as much as that. I've got them college. I got them to where their credit scores are seven, eight hundreds because I got them credit cards at young age and we only maybe bought a pizza, paid it back or bought gas and paid it back to build their credit. You know, these are the things that I showed them that even though my mom was savvy of those things, she never sat me down with those things. And see, this is where we have to take some responsibility as parents. You can't just push it out and say, oh, they're not learning this at school. You know, they're not, you know, doing these things and that they're not teaching you those things. We have to take responsibility as as parents and children that we're sending out into this world, you know, for them to survive. We've got to come back and say, yay, let's get some skills. Hey, if they doing this in school, you yeah, know, I broke down with my son how to balance a checkbook. He didn't even have an account. I took him through my checkbook. I say, this goes here, this is the credit, this is the debit, this is how you take things out, this is how you subtract, this is how you keep a running total. So I think with that, if we pick that up and push that on our, our children as far as that, I think they'll be in a better place. A lot of things that I, I'm going into law now, I was really uh, hesitant to uh, come on and be open as I was, because in this is just a stigma of, you know, being a lawyer and 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 the things that you have to encompass and what you have to keep secret and what you can't divulge and what you can't be. And then not only that, you're susceptible to opening yourself up to things when you start telling people things. 
And uh, I ran into a lot of pushback in that, uh, in, in, in school and, and doing that. But when I started picturing and picking out law schools and I start going on those law fairs and I start talking to some of them in mission and some of those lawyers that were teaching classes and I start telling them nits and bits, it's like, you are the perfect student we're looking to admit. Like you are the one that's like, we want to be lawyers. We don't we say we're moving past the generation of hiding everything. Of course, we're not kicking the law out and we're not throwing away the premise. But what we are trying to get rid of is just this misconception that law is not life. If <laughs> we have to flip that, you know, make life law. So we have to start applying these laws to how we're living and just stop writing them. And I, and I, when I got that empowerment, I said, oh, well, I can get into law school. You're not going to try to kick me out for being this free liberal. He's like, no, man. He's like, that's the best thing you can do. That's the best thing you can do is be available, be teachable. A, uh, a friend of mine came up with this, uh, came up with this, this fact when we first started a long time ago. And he said, I need you to be fat. And I say fat. He said, yeah, faithful, available, and teachable. He said, if you can be those three things, you can be anything you want to be. He said, be faithful to whatever it is you want to be, be available to whatever it is you want to learn, and be teachable so somebody can teach you something. And he said, if you could be those ways, I don't care whether you could be an astronaut. If you if you put that fat system in order, that's what you can be. So that's that's what I think about it. I think we just put too much on the onus on, and I'm a firm believer that of uh, uh, affirmative action and those things, yes, because it's a lot, you know, black history. I, I can't get away from that because it's my history, it's your history. It is our history. <laughs> it's the U.S. history. Oh, yeah, it's definitely yeah. our history. We've had so yeah. much great history in our um, whole um, lineage and everything. I mean, all the way back, like you yeah. said earlier, to the great uh, kings of Egypt and the great kings of a number of other folks as well. So definitely uh, we've had that kind of history for a number of years. I know that uh, Cara, who's popped in as well, will join us for a minute, but definitely I know that she's been involved in Cincinnati with uh, race relations and is a friend now of Brian's as well and everything, but I know she's done some stuff in Cincinnati and has appeared on my show a couple of times and everything, but I just wondered your thoughts about race relations, because I know I just had the privilege of watching my friend Sri Srinivasan, and he had a gentleman, I believe his name was Charles Blowon, who's written a book about the new black man as Festo and things along that line. I think that's the title of the book. But he talked about the fact that we need to have a new agenda and things along that line. And one of his fears is that actually that if, um, while we had won some major gains this election, that they could be short term, because he was actually pointed out that the both the Hispanic and the Asian population are overtaking the African American population, and also when you look at the electoral college, that seventy percent of the um, population will live in fifteen major cities, which means that thirty percent of the population will actually rule over seventy percent of the country and everything of that nature. So it's a fear that actually the uh, because most of us live in those urban areas. They will have those votes, but then we won't have to vote, say, in Kansas and in a number of other states because we're not necessarily moving to those areas. So I was just wondering some of your thoughts about uh, where we are as a people and even race relations in general. And then I'll bring in my good friend, Cara, as well. Absolutely. I, I, I definitely agree that the race, the race relations is, is a totally new dynamic now. It's no more of uh, just black and white. In, in the black and white issues. Yes, we see it manifesting uh, through a lot of this past 2020 and some of the things, but those are not new occurrences. Those occurrences has been happening uh, for the longest. I had an uh, incident just happened to me a couple of couple of Christmases ago uh, being pulled over. I just stopped on the side to find something in my glove compartment and I was looking and the police uh, pulled up on me. Uh, what are you doing here? Where are you going? 51, I was 51, then I'm 53 now. I was on 51. And I'm like, I'm oh, minding my business, get ready to go home. I'm off to the side of the road. And I, I don't even remember what I was looking in the glove compartment for, but just the audacity for him and his buddy to get out and just come and tap on my car and, you know, have me out and checking my information and for no reason at all. So these things are still happening uh, to us. <laughs> they, they, they haven't been. No, I didn't film anything. No, it, uh, thanks to the Lord, it didn't go 
you know, drastically wrong. I didn't reach for anything. Everything was up to snub and up to cold. And I was dressed appropriately. I didn't had a suit on. I was in baggy pants hanging down or, you know, any of those stereotypical things which you, you know, they use it so many times as excuses to even uh, start this kind of thing. But uh, I just was like kind of lost to where I was. And I was like, well, let me get this uh, map. I think that's what it was. I was looking for an old school map. And I, and I said, I know I pinpointed exactly where I was going and I couldn't find it. And I told him that. And he was like, well, why are you ping it on your phone? I said, I was trying to get the address. So I wrote on a piece of paper and put it in the glove compartment. So I was trying to get the address. And then I caught myself and I was like, well, let's revert back to why was I even really stopped? I was like, can you guys give me some of that? And, you know, and I said, I'm I'm studying law and, and I just want to get some refresher on the state understanding of American police and saying that this is what you all are doing. And I want to have an understanding of a clear knowledge. And, you know, of course, oh, so you're a smart guy. No, it's not that. I, I just need to understand. So therefore, I can alleviate this kind of thing happening again. So, you know, they was like, oh, well, we're just checking and it just looked like you were out of place. And I'm saying to myself, I'm on side, I pulled off the side of the highway. How am I out of place? It's a highway that people drive on every day to get to where they got to go. So I'm going someplace. So I'm out of place. But this is just the mentality that uh, people see. But as you were saying, too, and to refer to and, and to touch on that, we are going to be in the minority, uh, us and whites. <laughs> so for once in the country, we're going to be in the same boat. So whether you want to be in the boat with me <laughs> or someone that looks like me, uh, you know, you're going to need someone like me. And, and that's and that's all what it's going to be. And that's how it's going to be, because you got these communities are coming up. These Spanish communities, they are they are taking over. I'm looking at some of the ones that I work with. And this guy, these guys just come up here, man. They are do the jobs that you don't want to do. You know what I mean? They, I, I see them now. They're on construction sites. They're building. They used to be, you know, Tom and all his uncles and cousins used to get them construction jobs. Now I'm seeing the Spanish doing the construction. They're in the office building. You know what I'm saying? The guys from India, they're the smart, they're the brain. You can't call customer service and not talk to someone from that country. No one, even the customer service is even speaking English. I had a problem with my sprint the other day. I called. I could not understand anything that this lady was telling me, you know, and it was not to be derogatory. It's just what it is. So we're going to be the minority in these cases of these people thinking these ways. They, and they already think less of us as the U.S. I don't care what anybody say. I don't care if you think this is a great country or whatever your your thinking may be. Uh, the U.S. has digressed over these past four years. We really have. Our credibility, our sustainability, our intelligence, our democracy, and just whatever you think of, we have digressed. And it is because of not only because of who we had in the White House, but it's because of the moral challenges that he has taken us back to with our thinking and also with those that are smarter being taken to say, oh, this is a chance for me to come. This is a chance for that Arab or that Arab or that media, Middle Eastern or that individual that their mom and dad has taught them from the womb to read and educate yourself. They're going to be the smart ones to come in and say, oh, well, this American, he's pretty much lazy. Look who they just have for president. Look what he let them do. They just stormed the Capitol. You know what I mean? And he's siding with them. They're going to nitpick all of those things, and pretty soon they're going to be pushing us out. And be pushing us out. But that is my thought on it. It's a dynamic that we're really going to have to pay attention to uh, in these next few years, because this is a pause. I agree totally with them. We haven't won anything back. <laughs> and I know they was they was like, oh, we got two seats in Georgia, Democrats back in. This is a pause, because you best believe that guy down in Florida, He's mounting something to come back in four years. I'm telling you, because they already got him on. They don't even want to impeach him now. They don't even want to have a trial now. You know what I mean? So, yeah, man, that's what it is on that. But I can talk about that for him. Hey, Kyra. I'm just got off Hey, Kyra. Kyra, one of the things I know you talk about is it comes back to race relations and everything. And one, I would love to hear, because I love to hear different people's perceptions of uh, great leaders and everything, and even from different cultures. So we were talking earlier, me and Carl, about some of our favorite uh, African-American leaders and all of that. So I'd love to hear who some of your favorite ones are, because I do believe that some of these leaders were world leaders, and they weren't just the leaders of their own people. They were leaders of uh, the general population, and definitely some of them might have been more specific, like Harriet Tubman trying to fight against slavery, so might have been more geared toward the African-American population, but still was an inspiration to many women, and the same with Rosa Parks and a number of others. So I'd love to hear who some of your inspirations are, but then also from the food side, we do know that oftentimes, a lot of the times we are 
see a lot of the negative food side of what goes on in gut health happening in our communities because of the fact that oftentimes they're not doing the healthy food options in these neighborhoods. They're setting up stores in these neighborhoods and they're not necessarily providing good food options. There might be like a section of bananas and oranges and even sometimes those might be dated or whatever, but then a lot of times it's the junk food, the, uh, you know, the hostess and, and the uh, Twinkies and the other kind of things that we don't need to be eating as well as those quick sandwiches and everything that a lot of convenience stores sell as well. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on both of those things that I mentioned, both the who some of the leaders are that you admire and they can even be out of the food industry as well as some of your thoughts about how the impact can be in the minority community because of the way that some of those grocery stores are placed and the kind of items that they sell there and ways that you can fight that if you live in those neighborhoods. So, um, I mean, even the late and great Cicely Tyson, I mean, uh, hats off to her. Um, first of all, to be 96 yep. and, um, vivacious and lively and amazing through and through. And, um, just an inspiration to all. I mean, Star Trek, <laughs> countless movies, um, you know, just, just everything. And, um, just a pioneer, not just in acting and, um, like humankind, but in just, and especially, you know, pushing black people forward and saying, yes, you know, let's have representation. Let's have more of it, more representation. And, and I love that she just pioneered through that. She truly was the mold. So um, rest in power for her. And um, that was that was a huge, that's a huge loss. And um, I think in general, going to the food question is that unfortunately, food is marketed towards classes and it's kind of stereotyped in classes, you know, healthy foods and salads and whatnot. Um, that's just not something you think, like a lot of people think are attainable, even in small towns where I'm from, like, you know, just the whole idea of health food comes off elitist and not something healthy for you. And, um, I think that food is provided to people um, based off of stereotypes as well, you know, and um, that kind of needs to change because, again, representation, everyone should have access to all sorts of food, healthy food, not just what you think people of different social classes or races would be eating. So. I I like that the last year especially has blown open the whole notion that, hey, these stereotypes, you know, they're dangerous. They have to go. We have to have representation across the board for everyone. We have to have equal playing field and recognize people of, of different races and social classes and provide opportunities for all, you know, and it just needs to be that way, especially in, in food and in health. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. So Carl, what's your go-to junk food? I've talked to Carl and told her that I'm a iced tea junkie. It's a thing about growing up in North Carolina and all of that. And of course, I'm also known for having some other, like going to certain bad restaurants and things of that nature. But what is your go-to bad food? Because I'm sure that you have a go-to bad food that you go to as well. Oh my gosh, tater tots. <laughs> There's this uh, restaurant. There's this restaurant a block away from me. I just just walk. Sometimes when I'm walking, my dog Henry, I will we'll just stop and get tater tots. They're known for tater tots and other stuff, but 
they have these loaded tater tots with bacon and cheese and ranch and it's delicious. And I'm not going to deny myself that every once in a while I'll have it. <laughs> Sounds great. What about you, yeah. Carl? I'm sure there's something in New Jersey that you'll go to bad food. Uh, it's, it's probably chips, man. I, I am a uh, potato chip lover. Uh, they, uh, I, I can sit, uh, I, I think I'm the one that they envisioned when they did the uh, Lay's commercial. You just can't eat one. Yeah, I think that, I think they were thinking about me when they made that commercial because I can I get a bag of chips, whether it's a big bag, you know, and, and I just start eating them. I'm not done to the bag. <laughs> it's one of those things, man. Fun facts. Okay, so if you, you know how sometimes if you're like really wanting certain foods, it means mm-hmm. you are either wanting some type of experience or even lacking or needing vitamins and minerals. So, um, you know, potassium, right? It's found in potatoes, but also potatoes are of the earth. You dig them up from the ground. And sometimes if you're especially craving those potato chips or for me, tater tots, (laughs) like I pay attention to how centered do I feel today? How grounded do I feel? Am I feeling like I need to be more grounded? I notice that when I'm really wanting those tater tots, I'm kind of lost in my thoughts and I need to kind of gather myself. So when I'm like, I need tater tots more than anything, I really check myself. And I still get tater tots because they're amazing. <laughs> I got to check myself with that mark. They some I want some of them chips, man. Yeah, I got yeah, to pick on you because actually we're joined right now by our founder or one of the founders of international broadcast media. And like I told you, he is a lawyer. So he's going to tell you why you should either be a lawyer or why you should be a lawyer. Because Carl Watkins, who is our guest today, has said that he is studying law and is definitely interested in the law field and all of that. So he's like, um, I think he's doing the paralegal thing right now, but he is definitely, while he's involved in um, religion and he is a reverend as well, but he is definitely also very much involved in law. So that's why I sent you the bat signal and everything. Yeah, I, I saw I saw the bat signal, Mark. And yeah, but um, see, law for me, I went to law school uh, 37 years ago. So I'm showing my age. Maybe even longer than that. I graduated 37 years ago. So I'm definitely sure. What? I was born. You were born born 37 years ago? Around almost. Okay. (laughs) Carla, just think when you were born, I was practicing law, just to let you know. Okay. So now the question is going to law school. And and if you get a JD, it stands for it just depends. You know, like like everything, uh, JD is you get your JD degree. Just depends depends on. I mean, my number one thing problem that I have is student debt. <clears throat> Avoid that like the plague, because otherwise you start out really way behind the eight ball. I mean, the thing is, and and in, these universities love to load up people with student debt, and then you find out I become an indentured servant to my law degree which is not very good. So I would look to go to the most economically sound law school I could get into. In other words, don't look at anything except, I hate to say it, look at the price. Don't look at the prestige. The prestige is BS. No one gives a rat's rear what law school you went to. They just want to know you're the lawyer or not. I mean, do you ever go to a doctor and say, oh, you're my doctor. What what medical school did you go to? No, you don't. You just, they're a doctor. And the same thing with lawyers. But the, there's a big myth out there that makes a difference what law school you go to. And it, it, and it's a big myth. I mean, it's um, kind of a waste. Um, but n- now the other thing is uh, the three-year sentence. Okay, I call it sentence, all right? Uh, it's almost like going to prison for three years. So somebody goes, afraid of going to prison? Nope, because I went to prison already for three years. What's that? Law school. Okay, because what happens is part of it's like an endurance contest. Can you survive going to this for three years? In other words, three years, day in, day out, you know, where they they drop cases you got to analyze, you got to read this, you got to read that, you got to do that, and you got to do it for three bloody straight years. It's an endurance contest. Now, part of the reason I think they do that is they, they realize it weeds out people that really 
don't want to be there. In other words, or they don't really want to be there to the extent uh, they're willing to suffer for three years. The other thing is that they know that when you go out to practice and you get involved in litigation, it could be three years before you see a paycheck of that case. Uh, or it could be three years before you see the end of that case. Or like one case I had went 10 years, 10 years. Okay. And so you got to, got to get used to those long, long runways. Uh, but, but you really have to um, want it that bad. But so the, the key thing, number one, economics, can you get the price down? I mean, I hate to say it because a lot of law schools, um, you know, it's just real. What state are you in, Carl? What, what state? I'm in New Jersey and the, uh, the uh, university that I'm graduating with, they have, uh, they have a three plus three program, which uh, they kind of like monetize it for you. You do three semesters at their uh, university and they yeah. marry the last semester with your first semester uh, in law school. So mm-hmm. uh, they've partnered with three law schools that particularly that we do a lot of um, a lot of things with actually at a law um, uh, this morning. I had a uh, law fair uh, filling out the application and personal statement, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, yeah. So we got Rutgers is uh, part of yep. that. Uh, and yeah. we have uh, uh, Widener, which their law yep. school is in uh, Harrisburg. And we have uh, Drexel. Those right. are the three and four. All three of those schools, my my baby sister went to Drexel. So I know mm-hmm. she didn't go to Drexel Law, but sure. she went to Drexel. I already know they they are they, they like sixty some thousand a semester I think and that's what you get me so financial <laughs> some financial assistance uh, Rutgers is at the other end of that and Widener is in the middle I think Widener is like thirty five forty with the uh, they all give you some kind of uh, assistance and I think Rutgers uh, bottoms it out at about twenty three twenty four so I've already been looking at that because of that because what you're saying is is just been with everyone that I've talked to and, and been grounded with that. Um, Cause I was with the prestige, like, Oh, if I graduate from such and such, you know, it, sure. I'm automatically getting the job. And once I start running into some of these attorneys and I start doing some of these internships and working with some of these lawyers and I look on the wall, I'm like, I never heard of Northwestern Eastern state. They have a law. He's like, it don't matter where I went to law school. And they're singing. That's, the same right. That's true. They don't. They don't. Yeah, they was like, don't, don't worry about that. He's like, you ever heard of this law school? He said, you see my practice? And, and the guy that I was doing the internship with, he got 30 lawyers working for him. So right. he, it's, it's what you want to do and how you want to build. He said, um, right. money-wise, yeah, you're singing the same song. Money-wise, they're telling me that as well. Uh, you know, you don't want to dig yourself in a hole and be a slave to right. a slave to that, to that paper. Right. So we're, yeah, yeah, I definitely that. Oh, okay. you know, what kind of law you want to do, and then I've actually got to tease Nick about something that he said on his other show because I was watching it. Because as uh, Carl knows, sometimes I will bounce out of my uh, day job that I've got now, you know, which is a menial kind of labor and everything, in order to come here and do things with the international broadcast media. So I actually got home a little bit early so that I could get set up for this show and the one that, that follows it and everything. But tell him about what kind of law you want to do, and then I've got a question for. Based yeah. on something that he said on tax time, because I, he wants to sell some property, and I'm not sure that we can actually sell it. So I need to find out what kind of stuff <laughs> you want to do, and then I've got to ask him about this property that he wants to sell and everything. So I think y'all will enjoy right. what he's yeah. trying to sell. But definitely, first, yeah, yeah, tell yeah, us yeah. Like, what, what, what type of law, law do you want to do, Carl? Uh, I'm in uh, civil civil rights and family law, and uh, okay. both of those are pretty much drives me based upon my experiences with it. And like I was telling Mark, it's not an experience where uh, I think I'm a superhero. I want to change right. everything. I, I don't look at law as that. I look at law uh, in essence of me being vulnerable enough to use some things that I've yeah. overcome to go through the legally right. way of seeing how can I make some changes that uh, maybe in the old scheme of thing, it doesn't, it doesn't generate this big publicity thing. But how can I help my neighbor who's dealing right. with you know, and that's really why I wanted to be into law and, and family. Uh, the family law came about because I had a few family issues as a lad and abuse and some of the things I suffered. And there was just no help. <laughs> you know, there was just no help for people like me. Is sure. you know, just go live with your grandmother, you know, and that was what's supposed right. to solve the issue. But, so those are the two things that I'm deeply rooted in as far right. as uh, being a patron to. Well, would you be willing to move out of the state of New Jersey and go to another state? Uh, I have, I, I have been, uh, I got wooed. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say wooed, but I get, uh, uh, 
uh, spoken to a gentleman on Sunday. I had a uh, Zoom call with him. Uh, he's in uh, Amherst, and he was talking about the law school there in Massachusetts mm-hmm. and how they were supposed to be doing this pivot as in uh, minorities and right. offering more and trying to uh, diversify there. So he was offering me a lot there. Um, he said that I would have to go. It was online, and I'm kind of now that I am kind of leery about doing it online because mm-hmm. of the simple fact that I, I would like to be at a school. I would like to interact. Right. Right. So he said it's online, and he said you would come uh, to the school uh, two weekends uh, a month. Yeah. Uh, that you would have to come up to the school, and you know, it was but the numbers and things what he was saying will be something I was definitely in favor to. So I, I, me and the wife is talking. I'm like, you know, I think it might be better, uh, and it might be more feasible. And you know, if, mm-hmm. if we do think about going out of town for law school. I do think okay. so. Uh, really, really, really quickly, I think I'd also want to introduce you. I don't, can't remember if you met her yet or not. You probably know yeah. different shows. I don't know whether you met Cara yet, but Cara is talking to us about possibly getting a nutrition show. It's since you're one of the yeah. bosses, I need to let I, you I, know. I, 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 I did, I did meet. You know, you know, she wants to do a nutrition show for us, so yeah. I've got to keep yeah. plugging this nutrition show that she needs to have because she wants to have this <laughs> health coach and nutrition show on the international broadcast media platform. So I'm keeping plugging for her on a regular yeah. basis. And I did Thank meet you. Cara before. And the yes. thing is, yes, and the nutrition show sounds like a, a great idea. But also, Carl, I know the dean of the Washburn University School of Law in Topeka, Kansas. Now, why would you go to Washburn? Number one, uh, they're very progressive. You'll like the dean. Uh, number two, it's very reasonably priced. It's a state school. Robert Dole went there and if you can get in, I think uh, Washburn would be a great um, school to go to. It's in Topeka, Kansas. I was familiar with it for years. As a matter of fact, I actually applied and got admitted to Washburn. I ended up going to my local school, the University of Miami, because, you know, I'm from Florida. So you may not go there, but it's something that you may want to explore. And Carla Pratt, who's the dean there, has been really good showing up to the IBM TV network. She's been on a lot of our shows before. And uh, I think think that she may hit your wheelhouse. In other words, uh, be right up the alley of what you're trying to do and what they try to accomplish at Washburn. So um, Washburn University School of Law, I would put them on my list uh, to go to and certainly contact uh, the dean. Usually the funny thing, the way they, the schools work, usually it's not the dean. She goes, huh, go to admissions and they have some admission department somewhere. Yeah. But uh, see, the, but I found her to be very user friendly. In other words, somebody that uh, I've invited some other deans on and they're kind of like, here's when I'll talk to my students, you know, but Carla will come in and talk to you. Just letting you know, you know. Yeah, she's definitely a good person, and I've seen a couple of the shows that she's been on, yeah. and she's definitely very um, eloquent in the yeah. way that she speaks about a number of the legal issues. I think that right. she might have issues, and this is where I've got to tease you, Nick. I was watching Tax Time, and I saw that you want to sell the Statue of Liberty, and I was actually saying that you might want to sell Mount Rushmore I, and I, both I, Disneyland I, I and Disney okay World. I, I want to know hey, what hey, you hey, think about this. It I, seems I thought, like we're ready to sell all of this property from the United States that we've had for years in order to get some money going. So I'm trying I, to figure I, out I, I how actually. This is going to work. Hey, Mark, I accepted those as friendly amendments. Well, my goal is to sell the Statue of Liberty back to France, whoever wants to buy it, to reduce the national debt, because we really don't believe in give me your poor and all that other stuff. That's that's a fiction. We want your rich and your famous. We want your poor anyway. We already said that. So let's go ahead and sell the Statue of Liberty. Then Mark was going, why don't we sell Mount Rushmore? And I thought that was a great idea, too, if we can sell Mount Rushmore. They went on Disney World and Disneyland. All in favor, sell it all, Re- reduce it, reduce the national debt. I'm okay with it, Mark. Hey, yeah. and I'm in New Jersey. I'm in New Jersey across the bridge from the uh, Liberty Bell, and, and you can sell that because they got it late, taped off now. Can't go visit it with the virus. So you can sell that too and add that to the okay. bucket as okay, well. Okay, right. Yeah. In other words, the thing is, and we could put all these assets for sale, uh, you Absolutely. know, because we're not using them anymore and maybe use it to reduce the national debt. I think it's a great idea, Mark. So you and I are aligned with that. I just didn't know about Mount Rushmore. I think that would be, you know, so a good We're going to do, do a bundle sale. We're just going to sell it all the hair and everything. I don't know. So we, 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 hey, look, but, the Chinese are crazy. They'd probably buy the Statue of Liberty they and would. they'd spend a lot of money yeah. for it. You know, yeah. so they go, oh, we got an American um, American icon statue, the Statue of Liberty. And I said, hey, no problem. We got it free from France anyway, so it didn't cost us anything. Let's sell it to the Chinese, and they can put it in one of their harbors. Or and Carl said that one of the things in Cincinnati was actually the model for the Brooklyn Bridge. So I'm 
guess we could sell the Cincinnati Bridge as well. Is that oh, gonna be how can we use the bridge? How can we sell something we use? Well, um, if we get hey, car, car, if we get the right price for it, okay, it, yeah. for sale. I mean, the real it's all about the price, okay. True. So, real, real question, like baby, baby Brooklyn, aka the Roebling. Yeah, yeah right. And right. we can I mean, just get a different bridge. Yeah, yeah. A matter of fact, we could make the sale right on the IBM TV network. Uh, a matter of <laughs> fact, uh, I have a I have a place where they can go to to purchase it right on the IBM TV network. So it won't be a real. By the way, are we live here? Yeah, yeah. We're, to, we're gonna put it on the shelf. We're gonna put it on the shelf. Is what you're saying? It's gonna okay. be on the shelf. That's, That's right, right. Uh, to, because we do beam out to 122 countries, and maybe we can let them know that the Statue of Liberty is up for sale. At least it's being considered. I honestly, I don't even know who owns it. You know, I mean, seriously, Mark, it could be owned by the Port Authority of New York. I mean, I, we don't know. Yeah, right. I think that is yeah. yeah. So, so we so even selling it, we couldn't use it to reduce the federal national debt because the port authority would actually get the funds, and then I have no clue what they would do with it. But you know, it would go to the port authority of New York. So they just go up on the tolls. What? They oh, they go up, up on, on the, the tolls. tolls. No, the thing is, we want them to go down on the tolls, reduce the tolls. Yeah. Hey, you know Carl, what they need? Also, hey, Carl. Yeah. They Man, need it Carl's to build. Also got a great series that he does called The Daily Word. He does it on LinkedIn. So I want him to tell you about The Daily Word. And then I want to know what your Daily Word is and Cara's Daily Word. But I want him to tell you about what the whole Daily Word is so that you can learn about this fantastic thing he does where he talks about his Daily Word and has this whole thing that he does. So, Carl, tell him about The Daily Word. And then we're going to find out their words of the day as well. Uh, I, I was just telling, uh, and I was sharing with Mark earlier, and, and and to the audience on, I think I need me a show on IB. Maybe the, the Reverend and the uh, the Reverend and the Voice. I think we we need to follow that up. Um, I was telling him about the Daily Word and how, as as a child, I read a lot and uh, I always scribbled and always wrote and always in uh, a Christmas time. Uh, you know, long story short, I got um, a dictionary as a present, and uh, I was kind of like taken aback by that. Even though I like books, I had my Dr. Seuss series and. I would get my, you know, subscription sent to me. And I love reading, but I just didn't want that at Christmas. And my dad sat me down on the, on the uh, sofa with him. And he said, I gave you this because you're special. And he said, I, I gave you this. Is this, some, this is something that you're going to be able to use many Christmases after this one. So I, I didn't really, like, understand that at a point in time. He said, but what we're going to do, me and you are going to have a game. So we're going to go through the dictionary. We're going to go from A to Z. And I just want you to spell a word pronounce it, be able to use it in a sentence and define it. And that's how he built my vocabulary. And that's how he built able. So I was one of the few kids in the neighborhood of Chicago that didn't curse out everybody because I was actually, when they curse, I actually knew words to say that they wouldn't understand, but I really was getting the better of the artists. So right. those are, that was where a lot of that comes. So now what I've done in this daily word series that I do, I get a word. I, it's just a word just come to me in the day. It's not like no ESPN kind of thing going on, but it comes to me in the morning time and I just think about that word. So what I do, I post it. I post a definition, one or two, you know, so you can get understanding. And then I write on there what that word should mean to you, not what the dictionary has given you. I give you that as your option, but I give it to you as what it should mean to you in the essence of you actually enveloping that word, understanding it more so than what it is and what is it providing for you. So that's why I came up with that series. But I, I, I champion my father for that, for seeing something in me uh, as a child. That uh, he was just talking about a 12th grade education. He was he's a carpenter. <laughs> he's a carpenter and a painter. That was his uh, profession. But uh, he was a street smart, savvy smart uh, guy. And he knew that he didn't want me doing what he did. So he found a way. At that time, in the late 60s, I was born in 66. So in the late 60s on up, mm -hmm. he found something that, you know, would have me be prepared for what we're living in now. Right. And he was saying that resilience was one of his words. I don't know if Carl's got another yes. word. We'll come back to Carl. But definitely, what would your word be for uh, this particular week, Nick? So you get the one word and you got to come up with like a definition and everything that he said and everything. So what would your word be? Then we'll come to Carl as well. So what's your word of the week? We're going to make, make, make oh. it a daily word. Like Carl does, we're just gonna have a word of the week. So, what's your word of the week? Hey, Mark, see, my words are really easy. Unfortunately, they're four-letter <laughs> words. Are, are we allowed? Are we allowed to say four-letter words on this right now? Of your course, there's a lot of four-letter words. Okay. okay. You're, you're well, I, I have I have two two, two four-letter words. Okay, uh, love and hate. Mm. 
they're both four letter words. Okay. And unfortunately they, they tend to fight each other a lot. So, um, Anyway, those are my words of the day, love and hate, because we need more love and we need less hate. And unfortunately, the, wor the world tends to dwell on hate and don't understand the other words. So it's been yeah. it's been a real problem. And we're, we're trying to work on that at the IBM TV network, you know, because uh, and, and frankly, it's just not it, it's it seems to be everywhere in the world. I mean, as we we're, we beam to 122 countries they all seem to have very similar problems that they do here in the United States. And we need to kind of change the, um, the, the format of what's going on and media can help out a lot to do that because media does tend to uh, gravitate toward the negative parts of the world because they get a higher rating than the um, other parts. So um, anyway, those are my, those are my two words. They're simple, but they're both four letter words. Okay. And what about you, Carl? Um, so one word that automatically came into mind, um, that I was thinking of earlier actually was, uh, momentum. And so for me, momentum this week is gathering up what I have and going with it, right? So you take stock of who you are and, and what, what's going on now and you just run with it. And, um, you know, I guess now since, you know, Mark has been plugging me, I'll plug myself and say momentum of mm -hmm. the nutrition show. Let's do this. Let's get this going. <laughs> yeah, I know who just to contact. Well, I've been talking yes. to Ann Kit. That's what I'm saying. You got to talk to Ann Kit and Gwen because they do the product Gwen? development. Gwen, N-G-U-Y-N-N-G-Y-E-N. -N -N. Okay. Gwen. Well, I will talk to Gwen. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, well, Gwen, 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 more. Yeah, yeah, Gwen and Ann Kit, they, they do, I call it product development, or basically they put the programs together to get on mm -hmm. the IBM TV network, and they're working on quite a few of them, so they work on them all the time to get them oh. up uh, to speed. When I say quite a few, in other words, they'll be working on 10 of them at one time that are oh. going on the IBM TV network, so, but but you just want to get in queue so you, you get on the IBM TV network, because I told I've been them, working in kit hard, so maybe okay, I'll he, 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 well, well, did you email me, because I can hook them up? I can help you out a little with this. Okay, yeah, I'll okay. email you. <laughs> my my, you can, I, my um, email is simple. It's nick at ibmtv.tv. And I can, put a, I, can put a, I, can, I can put a plug in for you. I have some influence, but not a lot over oh, yeah. these people. So it's only uh, there, Nick. But my word is going to be unity because it actually comes back to love and hate that you were talking about. And I think that we need to be a more unified folks in terms of humanity and all of that. So unity yeah. is actually tied in to humanity. So I guess I'm going to seek out two words, humanity and unity. So that's definitely where I would be going is unity and humanity because I think that that's something that we – absolutely need. I would also, as I've said on this show and several other shows, and it kind of comes back to what Carl was talking about with this being Black History Month, I also yeah. think that we need to celebrate kind of our heritage and all of that. So actually, I'm yeah. going to steal a third word, heritage. So okay. unity, humanity, and heritage. Those are my three words. So it's all you, Carl. Look, look yeah. at those words, because I'm going to I'm going to use all of those words within this week in daily word. Yeah. I've, just, I've just written all of them down. So I, I got five words. I got I got I got love, hate, unity, humanity, and heritage. Yeah. So you guys are on LinkedIn. I'm definitely I'm definitely going to use those words. So be looking out for those. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I like unity, Mark, because the thing is, mm -hmm. that's one of the problems that we have in our dysfunctional Washington, D.C. You know, there's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff that people can do that would um, move the country forward for everybody, and uh, mm -hmm. without what they call, I call it political squabble. And we just need to work on finding the common grounds. Uh, unfortunately, our party system t t tend to like, everybody has to run to these different camps, you know, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> it's really stupid. Okay. What they got to do is there's a lot of stuff that can be done on a uniform basis that are really not partisan at all. And that uh, people need to get together and start working on it because they, they can build a better, bigger country. If we, move in that direction. Uh, but like even media, which we're into now, Mark, which yeah. like I said, I don't come from the media thing. I'm coming like sideways. I've noticed how challenging it is with our media in the United States, how uh, like uh, like we're bringing programs on, we're bringing car on, Carl on, we'll create programs, get people's word out there. But if you had to go to traditional media, which I do go to every now and then, oh, you want a show about what? Uh, 
uh, we'll meet with you next uh, fall to discuss it. And maybe in five years from now, we'll be able to do something. It's always maybe some, in other words, they'll never do anything. It's just ridiculous. Uh, so, Nick, so, you got it really wrong. The meeting is actually not next fall. It's not this fall. It's next fall or two falls down the line. And the show will come on 10 years from now. <laughs> exactly. Okay, exactly. Well, but Mark, you you just hit the nail on the head. In other words, so the thing is, my, my, my thinking was that you've got a lot of people out there with a lot of great stuff that can never get on major media. And it's because it's a, it's all the doors are closed. I mean, uh, what they call it, it's a glass ceiling. No, it's, it's complete cement ceiling. There is nowhere to go. So the IBM TV network is designed not to be like that. So the thing is this way that if there are some shows, we've got some people that are there that are, are willing to produce the shows and, and have something to say that has a following. We want to bring these people on and, um, and uh, actually, bring up their following and bring some good stuff to an international audience. Now, when I was at NAPTI this week, virtually, by the way, which is the National Association of Television Professional Executives, it's the largest group of TV executives in the world. It's been around for 50 years. They do all the buying and selling of content there. Okay, CBS, you may be familiar with that. It's big in the United States. CBS announced proudly by being on stage that they're in 24 countries and they work really hard to get into 24. The IBM TV network, as we sit today, we're in 122 countries. And I was going like, guys, don't you know, we've already, we're already in 122 countries. We already produce, and Mark knows this, we produce uh, shows out of South Africa and Nigeria through the African continent. We produce shows in Malaysia and India and Switzerland already as we're sitting today. And we produce them, not only beam out to a lot of these, we produce them. And CBS goes, we're in 24, like it's a big deal. It's not a big deal. <laughs> okay, we're, we're, we're already in the 122. We're not we're already in 122, and we're going to pick up some new shows. We're going to get Car her nutrition yeah. show. And as I was sitting there, and I was thinking, I was like, hmm, I think yeah. we need a daily word show on the network yeah. as well. So oh, yeah. I think Carl needs to have a show also on the network yeah. and like bring it from LinkedIn. Yeah. We all have... So what do you think, Carl? Do you, would you like a daily word show if we could get you through the AK? Man, I would, I would love it, man. And then, you know, then I already will have my mentor. Nick is already giving my mentorships. Like, I can't get, I can't get anyone to mentor me here because they said that uh, I have too much thought process into this law thing. Uh, so, uh, cause I ask a lot of questions and I think that makes, that makes a good, for me, that makes a good attorney, if, uh, you know, so mm-hmm. I, and I don't settle. Well, th- well, that, that's what you got to do. You have, you have to ask a lot of questions to your guests. Yeah, so this is a big investment of yeah. what I'm making in myself. And yeah. so I don't, I don't have a problem with that. And I, and I love it. And I love the mentality of that. Uh, and I love that the mentality of Mark. I, I this first time I met, well, I met him on the Brian Showman. And uh, it's just a certain. I don't connect with everybody. It's the same with Carol. I don't connect with everybody, and 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 I don't put my things out with everybody. But uh, sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, a lot of people is not as spiritual as I am. When I get vibes with people that I talk to, or I kind of get it, I, I can feel it through the computer. A lot of people say, "Oh man, you know when to worry." No, I can't. And I'm not any special to you, but I, I just get the geniality and the authenticity. Uh, authenticity of people when they're talking to me and the things that they're saying because I listen and I hear. A lot of people just listen. They say, oh, you're talking, you got to talk, so I'll, I'll let you talk. But I hear, I've heard what Mark said. I've heard even the tax thing. That's quite that's quite funny that you bring that up. And even Carl, when I talked to her earlier, because I was talking to her earlier, and we were sharing a lot of things, and I'm going to be doing some podcast work with her. The, 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 what you guys have and, and just the audacity of CBS to say, oh, we're doing a good thing with 24 countries. you got to be kidding me. You're not even scratching the surface of people who you would need to reach no. in order no. to even make a difference, you know? Yeah. And that's just that's just how people think. But uh, you guys are doing a wonderful job, man. I would love to be a part of this. I'm telling you. Yeah. Well, by, by the way, 62 of the 122 countries, English is mm-hmm. their primary language. Okay. Oh, wow. Then, then the other ones, English is their second language, and part of the reason they listen to the IBM TV network is it's a way for them to learn English. I mean, that mm-hmm. sounds weird, but like mm-hmm. Iceland, they watch a lot of uh, our shows because we speak English, and they all watch other American shows because they're learning English by listening to American programming. Uh, but we beam into Italy, and they watch our shows because 
again, we're a different, we're a foreign language in a lot of these countries, but 62 of them were actually primary language of just realize you do a show for the IBM TV network. You're not doing it just for the United States of America. You're actually global. Yeah. So when, when yeah. you're talking, by the way, spiritual shows, I've checked the ratings, spiritual shows do really well on the IBM TV network. I was checking one out the other day. I was flabbergasted how many people are watching spiritual shows. And we run, we even call it spiritual Saturday because we're running all these spiritual shows. Uh, they, they actually achieve high ratings yet for some reason, Carl, in our traditional media, they're just not, um, addressed. I mean, I, I don't see hardly any of them. It's just really weird. Sometimes you get a couple on Sunday and then that's yeah. about it. Yeah. But, uh, they're not representative, they're not of, very representative of no. people of, of the world. And what I yeah. love about IBM TV is that we, we are people, we're collectively a bunch of people. We have, um, you know, our own hats to throw in and yeah. contribute. And I love that. And, yeah. and what's represent like especially spiritual Saturday, people really buy into that. I know they're buying into it. Yeah, I love it. They, they're really <laughs> like, hey, you know, this I is what's meaningful to us. Right. And ma mainstream media, they want to be able to drive and oh, tell okay. people what well, they should be thinking. But people want more, especially this past year. They just want so much more. Right, right. And it's more. good that we just give it to them. Yeah, yeah. They, one more, we definitely give it to them on Spiritual Saturday and a number of the other shows that touch on spirituality even during the course of the day because I would argue that uh, funk music with Zach touches on some spiritual elements as mm -hmm. well and he had those two ministers that were related to him on yesterday I believe they, one was his uh, grand nephew or maybe it was the grand niece and the other one was the married partner so I can't remember which one was the uh, one that's actually related to him but definitely they were on there and everything so I guess by marriage they're both grand nephew and grand niece by uh, definitely they were on and definitely shared a lot of their religious thoughts but actually you bring up a good point uh, Nick and everything which is I do remember a time and I'd love to hear even what Carl thinks about this where you did see a lot more of a church programming on sure. the even mainstream networks and everything right. but you don't see that that much I'm now it's all been channeled toward cable TV and right. of course the churches are now Aaron I imagine even your own church there in New Jersey is Aaron on like YouTube and Aaron the services yeah. that way because of the pandemic and everything so the when do you think that movement yeah. happened? Because it does seem that we definitely got away from, I remember a time that you would see a lot yeah. more church services on there. Most of them were of the Christian background, but there was yeah. a few that even came from other denominations. There might have even been a few that were Jewish or Muslim or other kind of things. But I know there's been a separation lately, and I don't see that much on mainstream networks. So I'm glad that we're able to talk about all kinds of things, even and on Spiritual Saturday, having Ankit, who represents some of the things from his community, which if I remember correctly, I, I remember. Namaste. I learned yeah. that's Namaste. Yeah, uh, Namaste. In, in, yeah, that's right. Which, which is um, it was. It was, and when you when you say that, it was that even just not too many years ago, uh, you could turn the team services all kind of uh, different uh, worship services and, and different elements of, uh, of services and from ad and then the TV channels, they would start transitioning. But I can't say that pivot happened, well, I really took uh, notice to it, that pivot kind of happened after 9-11. And slowly mm -hmm. but surely, mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the dichotomy of how people thought about religion and even though we were pointing the fingers at the Muslims, right. just the dichotomy of talking about like, okay, you see what happens when we go too far in religion? This is what it bought. So there lies, and this is just my perception, there lies one where I saw a lot of the shows, just pretty much the TV was just like, okay, well, we're not going to give anybody a platform uh, for this. Because here we are, we're talking about let you get freedom of religion freedom of, uh, of speech and these things that we're trying to let these people use uh, the Constitution and amendments to their purpose. And, and what do we do? We give them freedom of speech and they fly a plane in the building. So they just, just as all things that America has done, quote unquote, they just put everything in the same bucket and said, okay, well, now then you start seeing the regular, the mom and pop shows or the old, uh, old Southern preachers that used to have the little half hour snippets. They just start snapping all of that away and, and you don't even see it anymore. And now we just as so much as a place with where we uh, went over these last four years of the country that the hate and the horror, the hate monger has right. grown to such a ball 
right now, if you even to come out of anything spirituality, it is not getting on the TV. I mean, you know, you can't even see Billy Graham, and everybody loved Billy That's Graham. That's right, right. He was on. You don't, you don't, you don't yeah. even see him on the TV, and like he right. was like the pre the president's preacher. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you know, you don't, you don't see that, and it's just really what 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 the uh, what times we are in. No one wants to hear that. In lies come the pandemic. So now people are seeing other outlets such as IBM TV and such arenas where, okay, it's comfortable to talk about uh, my religion, whatever it may be, but it's also mm -hmm. comfortable enough to start back talking about humanity because we're in a bad state. And right. I think people that are not is really starting to realize that. So how do I get that across to the to one that feels the same way I do? Let's get on a show like uh, Mark. So let's get on a show like Nick at, uh, or Karen. Mm -hmm. Let's start talk about that. So that Saturday, People then wind down the week. Oh man, they gonna talk about some good stuff on Saturday. That's where your audience starts to begin, and that's why it's creeping back up in that avenue. But I think, just from my personal opinion, after 9/11, uh, the the, oh. the premise of religion it took a dive. It uh -huh. took a dive, and it was on the back of just the Muslims, and everybody just paid the price. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're probably right because I've seen that that go astray. And you know, the sad part, Carl, is everything that bleeds leads in major yeah. media. And so the thing mm -hmm. is, if there's some bad event, let's let's um, let's focus on the bad event. If there's good mm -hmm. events and how people can work together and and build the economy, build people's lives, help people's lives, enrich people's lives. Oh no, that's boring. Let's not talk about yeah. that. You know, but we the, the, need more of that. I know, I know. And yeah. see, we're, 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 you know, Carl, we're, we're not, we're, we're not. We need more of that, but I got to tease y'all. There's something that Carl said before y'all joined and everything. We yeah. need more of that, but sometimes we go to the too far extreme. And I can tell you that, um, as this is Black History Month, that there used to be a time that the black press would spend too much time covering the positive stuff and they would get to the point of ridiculousness. With what right, they covered, because right. they would sit there oh, and yeah. they would literally cover the meeting, and they would tell you what was at the meeting in terms of like what the menu was that was served. Because I remember those kind of newspapers and everything. So you'd get the newspaper and it'd be like, you know, the meeting was held. This they'd get to the major journalism points of what the news story was, and then they would give you like an entire menu because they were just trying to flesh out the news story. And I'm sitting there reading the article, going like. This is really not doing me any good knowing that Gerald served fried chicken two weeks ago because I can't eat the fried chicken right now. <laughs> well, you're, make, you're making me hungry, but that's another story. Uh, yeah. The, the I mean, thing, it, you know, yeah. when it comes to let's 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 go to Black History Month because that's that's pretty interesting, Mark. You know, and and this is a problem that we have here in the United States because you know we do beam our shows in from the African continent. Mm -hmm. You know, the um, African continent doesn't get a lot of TV shows. In yes. press, and the thing is, it, there's actually a lot of development because I've looked at that in, in Africa. Uh, the the cell phone increase is going to be eleven thousand percent this year in terms of usage. In other words, for me, that's also more viewers who can watch the IBM TV ne network. Laos, Nigeria, where we broadcast from, is now the largest city in the continent. A lot of people don't know that, um, but it's overtaken Cairo, which has been the largest city. And, but, but, but you know, they have at least PBS. They did Rick Steves Europe. And you see all this European stuff, right? And we get hammered with British stuff. Okay. Right. But we don't get anything from the African continent. I mean, uh, Casablanca, because my wife wanted to go to Casablanca. Of course, they had that movie, all that stuff. I, I was looking at it and said, wow, we don't get much uh, press about what's going on there and what the history is. There's some of the richest people in the world actually came from Africa. Gets yeah. no press in the United States whatsoever. Um, the president of, let's see, what was it? Right off of Madagascar, the Mauritius was on our show. A couple weeks ago, first of all, I felt like a stupid American. I didn't even know where Mauritius was, but it is right off the. It's part of Africa. It's right off Madagascar. But Mauritius gets no attention here whatsoever in the United States. But it's a beautiful island. It's like um, the Caymans or Bermuda or Bahamas. But in the U.S., Mauritius, I'm going like, uh, where is it? I had to go look at. For me, I do it the old-fashioned way. I have to pull my globe. Where's Mauritius? Okay, then I find Mauritius. So, so the the, the real problem is that that we we really don't get a lot of history, a black history, and we don't get a lot of African continent history in the U.S. It's all Western civilization, and even where Ankit beams from in India, you know, 
I don't know much about India. I mean, so they're Googling it. I'm going, sorry, Ann Kit. You know, I know, I know you're a big country of 1.3 billion people. I don't know where you hide them all. But but Africa is also a big continent. There's 1 billion people in Africa. Well, and what's shown, That's like huge. what's going on, and, and, yeah, and Africa oftentimes, it's not really covered. And yeah. it was at least not as easily accessible to us than... Mm-hmm. You know, then then other parts of the world too so there's that it's it, going back to the whole notion of choosing what to cover and what not to cover sure right yeah and then there, there there's just not a lot of press so mm-hmm. so as i go, exactly. go, go go through the entire continent i'm going that that's a continent that currently has one billion people and it's um basically in the u.s in the general tv shows go show me a show on uh, africa right now you know, uh, can't, can't think of one that's on regular TV that I can think of and everything. But you're right; it's even tied. The uh, relationship between Africa and African Americans isn't even fully covered in everything. And no. we do that a number of uh, definitely African Americans came through the Caribbean and the Africa of various countries sure. and everything. And that whole history is not really explored. And there was even a movement by a gentleman by the name of Marcus Garvey to try to get quite a few folks to move back to Africa, and nobody ever hardly ever talks about that. At all, and that was a whole movement that was going on in the, the uh, like early 1900s and everything. So he had a whole movement going on, and I think he was even based, at least partially, in the New Jersey, New York area, if I remember correctly, and everything. So definitely, folks do not talk about what he yeah. was doing or the kind of dialogue that existed between him and uh, W. E. B. Du Bois, who was another person that right. was of contemporary of his. So as me and uh, Carl were talking earlier about Malcolm and Martin, they were the pre-Malcolm and Martin. So they were folks that were definitely uh, different opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of like their thoughts about what the African-American population should be doing in even in relationship to Africa. And there are even some folks that are doing those kind of movements now. I do know that there was even a couple of countries like Ghana that was offering... um, opportunities for African-Americans to come back to their countries and everything as part of their buildup. I know Ghana is one, I think Liberia is another, but there have been yep. a few African countries that have talked about trying to get more people that are of African-American descent to come back to their um, motherland as they would consider it to be and everything. So definitely those kind of things are not really covered that much. And you're right. A lot of things that go on even here on this network, we don't, uh, uh, we do a much better job of covering than mm-hmm. those big networks that got fancy letters in their names and everything. One that begins with a C, another that begins with an A. I would even argue the one that begins with a P, even though they might do a little bit better job of covering yeah. some of the uh, African countries and all of that. But I know you got some other issues with the one that begins with a P and everything since it's uh, <laughs> involved in that supposedly uh, – public aspect of things. Well, well, the, the only thing I get about PBS that I hammer on, Mark, is that, uh, and I've been to their meeting several times, we started with PBS, is their mantra is to buy everything from the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, not buy American programming. They don't care about American programming. <laughs> they care about BBC. And BBC, and their average contributor is a 69-year-old female. So that's part of the reason they go to the BBC network. They love the BBC type stuff. The problem is it doesn't help Americans. It doesn't help us. It doesn't help uh, the the type of work that we're trying to do. So we're we're as they say in football, we're going a different direction here with the yeah. with PBS, and and the, the, and they do Rick Steves Europe. Okay, great. Where's Rick Steves Africa? Hello, hello. Yeah. I don't see it. Okay, so so I can tell you this right now that most of the people like Mauritius. Okay, if you went around and you and you, which is uh, by the way. Um, one of the most prosperous African nations. But if you went around, you ask your American friends about Mauritius, where is it? They'll be like me. Um, I don't know, <laughs> you know, because it gets no love. It gets no attention, uh, you know, but, but there's a lot of countries over there that are doing things that we just don't get reports on. Ghana is one of them. Mm-hmm. Accra is a, a big city in Ghana. We get nothing about it. If it wasn't for a brother, Mike, I would know very little bit, bit about Nigeria. You know, um, yeah. Mor- Morocco, same thing. I mean, you just go through the whole continent. Yeah. When when did you see the special, the show coming in from Sudan? Never. It's a big country. I mean, this is the, you're talking about places that aren't small. And Egypt, are you kidding me? Other than, than wars, you don't hear anything from Cairo. You know, and, and I think uh, Egypt has a population of over 100 million people. 
And here in the United States, we ignore it like like there's no programming out of Cairo. So, yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, we're we're missing a lot of that oh. rich history and uh, rich heritage, as you would say, Mark. Yep, definitely not, not, being, not being given here. Missing a lot of the past stories and everything. There's no doubt about that. But I also guess must commend you, and it actually comes back to uh, something that is a friend of both uh, myself and Carl's, as well as now a new friend of Cara's as well, and that's a got to commend you, because this is one of the few networks that actually created its own award show for its uh, producers and everything else, and we even gave an award to our good friend, Brian Showman. So he helped us with the Halloween special along with Tim Sohn. So Brian is actually still proud of that. As a matter of fact, I think right. Carl, did he mention it just this past week and everything? Yes. He mentioned it several times. The fact that he loves getting yep. the award and he mentions it on LinkedIn regularly. So I know Brian is still very yep. proud of the award that we gave him because of the work that he did on the Halloween special along with his partner in crime, Tim Sohn. So they both got that you know, award right. for our right. best and, best best part. and all of that. And yeah. they both are great. They both are now helping me with the um, with my show. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah it, you know, Mark, it's, it's like it's like the People's Choice Awards, but it's real people that are getting awarded. Where if you in the Hollywood, the People's Choice Awards is really Hollywood people voting for Hollywood people, or people voting for Hollywood people. You, you know what I mean? In other words, like if you if you win the People's Choice Awards, you're a Hollywood person that's voted by Hollywood people. If you're an Oscar, you're Hollywood people voted by Hollywood people. There's no people's choice with real people there. So the IBM TV Awards is actually to award people but rather than award Hollywood people. Not that I have anything against Hollywood people. It's just they, they're, they're such a small subset of the world that we shouldn't... Um, I just don't really care about them. Yeah, I mean, we do have a show about that. We've got Celebrity Tuesday with our good friend Henning Morales. Yeah, you can do that. I'm still Henning because I've not had a chance to pop in to his show lately because of that day job and everything. But you're going to have to tell him that I've had at least several. Car has been all with me with a few of them, several filmmakers, and we have all, guess what? not come from Hollywood. One is now living in Maine. One is living in Australia. We've had a couple from other parts of the country. So contrary to what Henning has been trying to tell you, Nick, that Hollywood is the be-all and end-all of the film industry. We've had a few that have come right. from California, right. but Carl can tell you, because she's popped in on a couple of my mm-hmm. shows, them, that there have been quite a few filmmakers that have come from other parts of the world as well. Right. So well, well yeah, West Coast, West Coast be, but doesn't ne- mean California. Well, you know, well, I mean, you can make film anywhere. Okay, and I Holl- like to think I'm your sidekick now, by the way, Mark Lee. <laughs> you, you, you could be. Hollywood Henning's theory is that uh, he tells me all the talent, just so you guys know, all the television talent, movie talent are within a 10 square mile radius of Hollywood and mm-hmm. the rest of the world forget it. Okay. That's Hollywood, honey, yeah. which, which is okay. But see, my theory is a little different. Okay. The population of that whole County is 10 million. The population of the world is 7.8 billion. Okay. My argument, Mark, is that the top people of that 7.8 billion is a lot of people and you're going to find some talented people. They're not all in Hollywood. But unfortunately, that's not how Hollywood thinks. Uh, Hollywood thinks all the talent is within that 10 square miles. And I just disagree. I think, uh, you know, we can get talented people from all over the world and you don't have to live within a 10 mile square, bra- you know, bracket of Hollywood to, to have talent or have a show or be on TV or have anything to do with what they call the industry. OK, so that's it. You know, Hollywood is Hollywood. So he runs. Yeah, he runs the show so we can know what's going on in Hollywood, but to me, that's only one part of the whole world. The world is much bigger than that. So we're at IBM TV, like I said, our goal is the whole world, not just a 10 square mile block of Hollywood. And the IBM TV Awards for real people that have actually done something rather than the People's Choice Awards where they award the same old club or the Oscars, which award the same old club or whatever else they do there, which award the same old club. And I could care less about their club. You know, I really can't. Exactly. Oh, Nick, Nick's created his own club. It's the uh, International Broadcast Media Club, which we yeah. like to be a part I, I, of. 
the that, IBM TV. The that's IBM right. That, TV that's nice. perfect. We definitely, we've got those store items and everything. So, Nick, we just let you know we've got the cups. So we need yeah. to have more people buying those cups on a regular basis. There's even a T-shirt that is involving one of my uh, shows and everything, as well as some uh, stickers for the online oh. dinner party. And I just learned that I've got a visor for this show. So this show has a couple of products, including a hat visor. So there are a number of other products. I know that the uh, fine folks that are doing the learning show have got a uh, product. I believe IBM TV yep. has got a bomber's jacket. So Brandon has got put up some other products and yeah. are continuously yeah. adding new products. So hopefully folks will go out there okay. and support the IBM TV store so that we can get some pay off of that as well because okay. the money is going to support those of us that are doing the programming on a regular basis. So yeah, and, definitely and, need folks to get out there and do those purchases on a regular basis. And we might even have to get uh, Kara and uh, Carl at some point to get a product as well. We could have like maybe a uh, Carl painting or a Carl book or a Carl something going on. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and we're also doing the NFL sisters in service this year. Yes. It, looks like, it looks like that got funded. So the thing is, Mark, we're actually going to be, see, see funding an, an, a, an event outside of our network is pretty expensive, but it looks like somebody's going to step up and fund that. So we're actually going to be filming at the Super Bowl at Raymond James Stadium, outside of Raymond James Stadium, starting Thursday. And NFL Super uh, Sisters in Service, for those who don't know, it's the wives of the NFL football players who get, get together to promote good projects. Uh, throughout the uh, country of the United States of America, so that unfortunately that's kind of limited the U.S. But I think we're going to be one of the few pre-Super Bowl shows that got permission to actually film outside the Super Bowl, and that's going to start this Thursday yeah, on, the I, this on the Thursday IBM the game Network. is on Sunday okay. between Kansas City right. and Tampa Bay, and we actually had Stephanie Anderson, who is yeah, one of the Stephanie founders of that organization, on. Yeah. The uh, roundtable, the uh, producers roundtable that comes on after funk music with Zach, and she definitely shared a lot about that as well as sharing uh, her concerns about concussions because I believe her husband right. is actually her still husband facing concussion. those kind of uh, consequences from the concussion that he suffered some time back and everything. But she shared a lot of those concerns, and it was a very powerful conversation. So if folks have not had a chance, go back and check that out. I also understand, I think she's going to be on tomorrow on Travel Tuesday with Brandon, according okay. to what Kim has said. And I've also invited her to appear on some other shows as well. So she so should be appearing regularly over the next uh, several days to hype up the activities that they've got going on in that regard. So it should be an amazing time. And I know yeah. a lot of folks are Looking forward to the Super Bowl. My team is not in there. The Minnesota Vikings nor the Carolina Panthers are nowhere near a Super Bowl. So maybe next year, maybe the year after, maybe sometime in the near future. My good friend that actually lives in New Jersey, who I do my regular audio podcast with, is a Baltimore Ravens fan. He thought his team was going to be there, but Dean was out of luck in that, that regards also. So maybe Carl's team is actually in the Super Bowl. Maybe he was rooting for one of these right teams and all of that. So as we get ready to wrap up, because I've got to do Mullins as well, but okay. I'd love to hear who are the folks backing in the Super Bowl since uh, Nick brought it up and also any words of wisdom, since that's oftentimes the way that I wrap up a lot of my shows, is any words of wisdom and positivity that they want to share. You've been with me pretty much since the beginning, Carl, so I'll let you start it off. So, Carl, who are you rooting for in the Super Bowl? Any, any words of wisdom or positivity that you would like to share? I am. Uh, I'm an old school guy, so I'm rooting for, of course, uh, Tom Brady. Uh, I didn't like him when he was with the Patriots, but I just found it phenomenal what he's doing now at the age that he is, and then just to come and do this in a whole nother conference. <laughs> it's just it's just on the Michael Jordan kind of range. So uh, I definitely am uh, rooting for uh, him in that. And uh, my words of wisdom uh, that I don't, that I do have for today is just really what we've all been talking about these past few days. Just have, just show that humanity to our people. I just had a lot of thoughts running through my head and I just got a lot that I'm going to be writing uh, with those words that you guys gave me because that, that just gave me a lot of food for thought and it brought a lot of things to the forefront of, of what we're talking about and uh, it's definitely uh, the humanity. It's, it, it's where we are right now. It's no other way around it. It's no other way to look at it. If we don't start pulling each other up, uh, we're all going to go down. It's going to be the rich or the poor. It's not going to be the have and the have nots. I mean, we had, we had a basis in a point in this country that humanity is going to have to win out or everybody's going to lose. Everybody's going to lose. So that's my word for the day. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Kara, who are you rooting for in the game? And do you have any words of wisdom to share with us as you oftentimes do? And I don't mind you being my sidekick because you <laughs> actually make a great sidekick and all of that. So sometimes I send out the bat signal like they send out the bat signal for me. <laughs> yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so I am rooting for um, the other team, Kansas City. So um, Tom Brady can just be knocked off his pedestal some more. Sorry. <laughs> And, uh, you know, Tom Brady doesn't have to win the Super Bowl all the time. He can just lose a couple. So uh, that's how I feel about it. As for words of wisdom, just, um, yeah, really take time to get to know your strengths and what makes you you as well as your weaknesses and and be okay with it and and accept other people's strengths and weaknesses as well. And um just going along with humanity, just accept yourself and accept others and, and just really hone that in. I feel like the more that people do that on a human, a human level, the more contagious and the more uh, momentum you bring. And if we can just accept each other for who we are and um, use our strengths to lift each other up, the better off we'll be. So don't be afraid to be you and uh, make some magic happen. Sounds good. Nick, mm-hmm. what okay. are you, well, well, you ready for and words of wisdom? I, I will tell, tell you Tampa Bay all the way, but here's the reason why Tampa Bay all the way. Okay. Um, my, my family actually settled the Tampa Bay area in 1868. I have 2,000 relatives in the city of Tampa. I have 75 first cousins. My mother has 110. I have I have cousins who are straight. I have cousins who are transgender. I have cousins who are African-American. I have cousins who are Mexican-Americans because they're all on Facebook. I know all these cousins. I got like 2,000 of them. How do I know I had 2,000 of them? The Bellamy Brothers, which sung this uh, song, Let Your Love Flow, invited everybody to their ranch in Darby, Florida, that were related to the Palavias and the Barthels who settled here in 1868. 2,000 relatives showed up. They did that once. They never did that again. They go, there's too many of them. Okay, in the city of Tampa. So uh, even though I agree with Cara, Cara, I really don't like Tom Brady, but I do love Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay all the way. And so the thing is, I'm I'm heavy backer of Tampa. Go Tampa Town. That's where I grew up. Which that's, is, you know, that's the great thing about having four people on a panel. We're just going to have to, and I need to get your thought and uh, come back to that because we only got about three minutes. If you got a quick thought, uh, give that to me, and then I'll tell you who I'm really for. Quick thought about what? Nick. Words quick of thought. wisdom, Nick. Words of wisdom. Yeah. Uh, words of wisdom, number one, stay safe from this co- COVID-19. This is nothing you want to play with, baby. You know, uh, I self-isolated. I am not traveling. I used to travel a lot. I'm not going anywhere until I get my little shot, you know. So I love to travel. I like to go out and see people and stuff like that. But, dude, this is this is, this is is something that is serious. I mean, um, so the number one rule is safety first. Stay safe. No doubt about that. Definitely got to stay safe and all of that. Um, we're going to just have a tie because I'm going with Kansas City. I think that they've got an amazing team, that they've got, they've got a tough team, so we're just going to settle in a tie. As far as words of wisdom, I definitely agree that we have to stay safe. We have to be unified and definitely have to create ways to create a one uh, – there's a uh, old song about one world and all of that, and I'm a big fan of the fact that we are – one world and we need to be unified as one world so definitely that is my words of wisdom and you are so right about the vaccine i was talking to a friend of mine in vegas they drove all the way to arizona and then they got there and even though they had an appointment they were not able to get the vaccine and then as they were talking to the doctors they found out that half the vaccine that are the vaccines that aren't being used are then being thrown away. So like I said, we've also not even doing good things in the way that we are distributing the vaccine because my friend Janine was telling me that and she's like, I drove all the way from Vegas to Arizona where she does some teaching at and then turns out that she was not able to give the shot and they were like basically saying, come back in three hours and we might have it for you. But that was not going to be the case. So she got very frustrated and now she's going to wait to see when it comes to like Walgreens or one of our 
local drugstores and all of that. So on that note, I'm going to end the show and hit end broadcast. I'm glad that y'all all could join me, and I'm going to hit the end broadcast and then shift on over to our other show, which, of course, is that great show that we do in the title, the Mullins Music and Memories. So I will play our little theme song as well in order to end it all, but that means I'm going to head on over there, and we'll just call it a wrap on the radio show with Mark Lee. Thanks, Nick. Now I gotta go jump.